Hi everyone. Hope you are doing good. I am very happy guys. Why? Because you guys decided to watch this lecture. You guys decided to learn something. You guys decided to become the better version of yourself. I am very happy indeed. It is a historic milestone. Yes, our country conducted the first INICET exam. Common entrance tests for the institutes of national importance. Particularly in physiology, the questions definitely came from the familiar territory except one or two questions. The exam is over, done and dusted, ranks are out. Then why this discussion sir? Particularly for the questions we know, the explanation part. You have to be thorough with the explanation part because from that explanation, definitely you are going to get questions for your upcoming exams. And here it is going to be about a very crisp discussion with the crisp explanations. Particularly in this exam physiology heavily renal physiology was targeted, physiology of kidneys. We were moving into that question section. Always remember it is my principle to talk less, talk simple, convey more. I will stick on to that principle. Let me show you the questions now. It is going to be a very interactive session. Whenever I ask you certain questions, please to write in the comment section your answers. I will ask you a lot of questions here. Please try to answer them. First question is in front of us now. Look carefully. Which of the following statements are correct regarding mechanism of depolarization, repolarization, hyperpolarization in the skeletal muscle action potential? Action potential, very familiar topic. What are the options here, sir? They particularly asked you which channels are involved here. Yes, I think it will be very easy for you guys to answer correctly. What do you think is the answer? Tell me right in the comment section. What do you think? Yes, majority answering correctly. Depolarization due to sodium. Repolarization due to potassium. Hyperpolarization is also due to potassium, but which channels are involved? For the discussion, look into this important diagram first of all. Three action potentials I am showing you guys. What are the three action potentials, sir? Motor neuron, skeletal muscle, cardiac ventricle. The classical thing to be noted here is the time scale. First question. Which action potential do you see is having the longest duration? Action potential with the longest duration? Cardiac ventricle. The one with the shortest duration? Yes, sir. Motor neuron. This question is about skeletal muscle action potential. Essentially, skeletal muscle action potential and neuron action potential looks the same except the time scale. The skeletal muscle action potential duration is 5 milliseconds. Next important question. With the help of a red arrow mark, I am going to point to something. Tell me correctly guys, look into the diagram. The red arrow mark is coming now. What I am pointing? A particular potential value. What is that potential value? Yes, correct. Resting membrane potential. We are clearly saying in a motor neuron it is around minus 70 millivolt we know. In skeletal muscle and cardiac ventricles it is around minus 90 millivolts which is clearly seen in the diagram. Now in action potential very important to face. Moving towards a positive value what we call that phases depolarization DE. Following depolarization this cell regain its own polarity back that is regaining phase repolarization. Following this repolarization, there is more negative going below RMP. What is that phase? Hyperpolarization. Now let's look into the ion channel causes. First about depolarization, tell me the most important channels involved here are sodium channels. What type of sodium channels are they, sir? They are sensitive to particular voltage, voltage gated sodium channel, simple. Next question, correctly answer me guys. This type of voltage gated sodium channels are blocked by physiology and pharmacology. They are blocked by this voltage gated sodium channels. The clue, pain receptors blocked by, yes, your lignokine, local anesthetic agent. 
and also one very important toxin particularly we obtain from the puffer fish what is the name of the toxin sir tetrodot toxin very important remember this blocker name the cane group of drugs local anesthetics and tetrodot toxin next question are you guys ready extracellular concentration of one important ion is going to determining the opening and the closing of the sodium channels one ion is going to determine the opening and closure of the sodium channels which ion is that any guess again clinically important yes you are answering correctly extracellular calcium level regulates the opening and closure of this voltage gated sodium channels it was asked before what is the importance sir particularly whenever extracellular calcium is low hypocalcemia low hypocalcemia look at my hand look at my hand what is this classical manifestation in hypocalcemia tetany tetany is characterized by hyper excitability why sir because whenever there is hypocalcemia this voltage gated sodium channels open more frequently low calcium level means they open more frequently more action potential firing that is the reason for hyper excitability make yourself very clear from depolarization let's move into repolarization or e we all know the channel responsible is potassium channels voltage gated potassium channel in experimental studies we block this potassium channels with the help of an important substance tetraethyl ammonia remember this other than these two phases the third one obviously is hyperpolarization look very carefully what is the importance of this hyperpolarization sir those potassium channels responsible for repolarization they close very slowly remember those potassium channels they close very slowly the reason due to slow closure of voltage gated potassium channel the rmp goes even more negative that is our hyperpolarization very important next question one particular neurotransmitter produces all its effects by causing this hyperpolarization which neurotransmitter hyperpolarization what is the significance any guess yes that inhibitory neurotransmitter gaba it is going to cause hyperpolarization because of this hyperpolarization look very carefully there is increase in threshold for action potential generation because the rmp is even further lowered now there is definitely going to be increase in threshold for the next action potential generation hyperpolarization always means inhibition take home point gaba is the neurotransmitter definitely which is going to cause hyperpolarization now you know very simple action potentials which all phases which all ion channels are responsible with that note now look very carefully next question true statements regarding skeletal muscle contraction are yes this question this topic was actually asked in last aims exam also any guess true statements regarding skeletal muscle contraction are answer me guys yes tell me what are all the answers yes very simple extracellular calcium is not important for contraction calcium is releasing from the sarcoplasmic reticulum very important for contraction if you don't know the answer let's look into this discussion very important discussion guys the storehouse for calcium in skeletal muscle is this very well developed structure i am highlighting now sarcoplasmic reticulum inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum we are seeing storage of calcium ions particularly the muscle cell membrane sarcolemma look very carefully it is exactly looking like an alphabet t yes yes sir that is why it is called as t tubules there are certain calcium channels here the first one that is found in this t tubule i am going to project that now red arrow mark what is pointing dihydropyridine receptor present in t tubule membrane the next important calcium channel that is present in sarcoplasmic reticulum what is that sir rhinodin receptor both are just touching each other this type of interaction 
what type of interaction is this they are touching each other they asked this question in last times exam this is a classical example of type of mechanical interaction if you want to open this rhinodine receptor what is actually needed a neural signal in the form of action potential is needed whenever action potential comes very important point there is a conformational change between these two channel proteins rhinodine receptor opens calcium will be released out it is this calcium that aids in actin myosin interaction and muscle contraction once the contraction is over all the calcium will move back into the storehouse what is the storehouse sir sarcoplasmic reticulum to move all this calcium back inside there is one more calcium channel present here what is that calcium channel called as sir cerca pump once the contraction is over all the calcium is brought back inside with the help of cerca pump remember it is the action potential neural signal that is very important for the conformational change between dhpr and rhinodine receptor rhinodine receptor will open calcium will come out responsible for contraction with this important note this type of mechanical interaction they are repeatedly asking this model is called as lock and key model what is this lock and key model we are clearly saying look very carefully the lock here is our rhinodine receptor locked the key here is our dihydropyridine receptor what is actually going to cause the conformational change responsible for the opening of rhinodine receptor who is this guy this guy is our action potential make yourself very clear on this concept it's a type of mechanical interaction this model is a classical example for a lock and key model with this important note another expected question from this topic now we know sarcoplasmic reticulum is the storehouse for calcium particularly in skeletal muscle look very carefully inside this sarcoplasmic reticulum we have a very important protein i am going to highlight that protein now in this entire diagram a red box highlighting that what is that protein calcsequestrin make a note what is this calcsequestrin sir this calcsequestrin is considered to be a calcium buffering protein it's a type of calcium buffer present in sarcoplasmic reticulum through this calcsequestrin we are going to release calcium this calcsequestrin is eventually getting attached to our rhinodine receptor how it is going to get attached is sir there are certain proteins which are going to attach this calcsequestrin to our rhinodine receptor what are those two important proteins name junctin and triadin this two important name make yourself familiar junctin and triadin they attaches our calcsequestrin to our rhinodine receptor very simple first point calcsequestrin is the calcium buffering protein second point calcsequestrin is attached to rhinodine receptor for calcium release the proteins junctin and triadin attaches calcsequestrin to our rhinodine receptor over simple with that note let's move on to the next question sequence after p wave another very chronic repeat topic guys particularly this topic is keep on repeating cardiac cycle sequence after p wave what do you think i'll tell you the answer now a wave then rapid filling of ventricles then first heart sound then t wave this is the sequence how to remember this sir this diagram which i am going to show you now is a gold mine what is this diagram sir vigas diagram particularly for cardiac cycle the pressure volume changes listen very carefully even last aims exam also they picked one question from this important diagram now let me show you with the help of arrow marks they are asking the sequence after which wave p wave so after p wave what is happening particularly in the jvp wave form we are clearly seeing a wave is there yes sir a wave atrial systole atrial contraction look very carefully atrial systole a wave atrial systole it is this atrial systole responsible for around 20 percentage of ventricular filling this atrial systole can help in filling of ventricles we call this as atrial kick event 
atrium is contracting and kicking the blood into ventricles so filling of ventricles can happen after this what is happening look into the diagram our first heart sound s1 after this s1 definitely we are going to see t wave very simple they asked about the sequence after p wave the first one definitely is a wave atrial systole responsible for ventricular filling then first heart sound then t wave very important this vigorous diagram very high yield make yourself very familiar guys cardiac cycle let's move forward next question when a person changes posture from supine to standing another high yield area cardiovascular regulation we discussed in detail in our videos what are all the changes you expect when a person changes posture from supine to standing any guess tell me the answer now what are all the possible changes yes look very carefully there is decrease in firing from baroreceptor on immediate standing mesenteric vasoconstriction increased cardiac contractility very important discussion coming guys on standing from supine position two classical changes happen immediately at the same point of time what are those two changes there is transient fall in blood pressure there is going to be venous pooling in lower limbs on immediate standing this we know very important points baroreceptors fire whenever there is increase in blood pressure here there is transient fall in blood pressure that means baroreceptor firing will decrease whenever baroreceptor firing decrease look into my question which nervous system will be activated when baroreceptor firing is inhibited or decreasing which nervous system will be activated any guess even if you don't know a very simple common sense transient fall in bp is there if you want to rise bp which nervous system which component of autonomic nervous system needs to be activated yes true sympathetic activation because of the sympathetic activation obviously the effects are increase in myocardial contractility rise in heart rate vasoconstriction all these three mechanisms are trying to restore our blood pressure sympathetic activation now tell me the question sympathetic activation which neurotransmitter is released that is responsible for all these effects yes norepinephrine true it is the one that is eventually going to restore blood pressure this is the normal mechanism which will definitely happen in you and me if we immediately stand up a very pathetic situation look at this guy oh my goodness what is happening to him any guess anybody what is happening to him on standing he is falling down a clinical scenario based question look carefully reduction in systolic bp of at least 20 mm of mercury or diastolic bp of at least 10 mm of mercury within 3 minutes of standing or head up tilt on a tilt table exact lines from harrison's any guess any idea the basic pathophysiology here is sympathetic vasoconstrictor failure what we discussed physiology before the wellness here in this individual is illness wellness and illness sympathetic vasoconstrictor failure that is illness what is this clinical disorder this is classically called as orthostatic hypotension or postural hypotension very important that's the significance clinical significance of this topic orthostatic hypotension now look carefully we'll move on to the next question now look into this question guys very important macula densa the cell md is formed by which part of nephron simple question only what do you think is the answer macula densa is formed by which part of nephron yes it is distal convoluted tubule let me tell you first this macula densa is a part of an important apparatus what apparatus sir juxta glomerular apparatus let's see that first a typical juxta glomerular apparatus will have three important cell types what are they the first one is our juxta glomerular cells or jg cells the second one is our heros macula densa and the third one 
is our extraglomerular mesangial cells. This three comprises juxtaglomerular apparatus. The location of this macula densa was actually a controversy. We will resolve that now with the help of a simple diagram. Now look carefully guys, very simple diagram. With the help of a circle, I am going to focus you macula densa. Where it is? Exactly here. This macula densa is actually the location where your thick ascending limb of Henle end and distal conlitter tubule begins. It is exactly at the junction where thick ascending loop of Henle end and the distal conlitter tubule begins. So what is the answer we have to choose here? Distal tubule was there in option. So it is easy to choose distal tubule. What is this macula densa sir? What is the function sir? Macula densa is considered to be something called as a GFR sensor. Glomerular filtration rate sensor. It can either increase or decrease GFR depending upon the situation. How? How it is going to modulate GFR? Simply by affecting the resistance of one important blood vessel, afferent arteriole. Macula densa regulates GFR by regulating the caliber of afferent arteriole. Let's look into few simple situations. First scenario. Increase in glomerular filtration rate. Simple. Increase in GFR. More filtration. That means more sodium chloride is now reaching our macula densa. Whenever there is increase in sodium chloride concentration in macula densa, it is going to release a mediator and that mediator is adenosine. Increase in GFR, macula densa releases adenosine. This adenosine is going to cause what effect on afferent arteriole I told you. Adenosine causes constriction of afferent arteriole with the help of which receptor? A1 receptor. The beginning part, when you constrict the afferent arteriole, obviously GFR will decrease. It's a classical example for a negative feedback mechanism. Increase in GFR is followed by decrease in GFR. Now look into the other scenario. Listen very carefully. Whenever there is decrease in GFR, less filtration, less sodium chloride in macula densa. Whenever there is decrease in sodium chloride concentration in macula densa, macula densa does two things. First important thing, it releases nitric oxide. Second important thing, it decreases renin release. Very important. Whenever there is decrease in GFR, macula densa is going to release nitric oxide and decreases renin release. Obviously, nitric oxide, vasodilator, it is going to dilate our afferent arterioles. Dilating afferent arterioles, the caliber is becoming big now. Dilating afferent arterioles, GFR will increase. This is a classical example for a negative feedback mechanism. What is the name given to this negative feedback, sir? Tibules are giving feedback to glomerulus. That is why it is called tibuloglomerular feedback or TGF. Macula densa is involved here. With this important note, let's move to the next question. Yes, guys. This is a graph depicting the filtrability of dextron through our kidneys. One here represent complete filtration and zero representing no filtration. You have to choose in this graph what are the substances A, B and C. Any guess? Any idea? Dextron. First question. Why dextron here sir? Because in labs we can make this dextron to be having a positive charge or negative charge or neutral. We all know filtration of a substance in our glomerular filtration barrier is charge dependent. Let me tell you the answer first, then we will go for the discussion. The answer is option A. A here is polycationic, B here is neutral and C here is polyanionic. Now let's discuss this very important one. Listen very carefully. Cation, cation T positive. Polycationic dextron is positively charged. Any substance that is positively charged, look very carefully. That is our polycationic dextron here. Positively charged molecules are filtered much more readily than our negatively charged molecules. 
even there is no charge at all if the substance is neutral look very carefully even this neutral charge substances or neutral dextrons they are filtered more readily than our negatively charged substances so it goes in that order positively charged ones more filtration the next one is neutral the least one are the negatively charged substances why we have something called as filtration barrier yes sir this filtration barrier we have two important concepts that is the concept of charge and size anything that is negatively charged will be eventually repelled why sir because this filtration barrier is lined by a polyanionic proteoglycan polyanionic proteoglycan that confers negative charge that is our apparent sulfate so negative and negative repels each other your albumin will be reflected this again the important one the concept of size you can expect this question soon any substance having the size of 4 to 8 nanometer will be easily or freely filtered anything which is having 4 to 8 nanometer size freely filtered any guess what is the molecular size of albumin anybody any idea please remember this albumin the molecular size is usually around 3.6 nanometer even because of charge it is repelled but this size can let our albumin to pass through because it is only 3.6 nanometer look very carefully small amount of albumin is actually filtered in healthy individuals whenever it reaches proximal colloidal tubule it is retaken back into the system even though it is filtered in small amounts eventually at the level of pct definitely it is going to retake back inside with the help of certain proteins this process endocytosis what are these proteins sir megalin and cubilin they are the proteins responsible for endocytosis of albumin at the level of pct whenever small amount is filtered no problem at all we will reuptake them at the level of pct with the help of two important proteins what are they the endocytosis proteins here are megalin and cubilin at proximal conlytic tubule very simple logic positively charged substances are filtered more next is neutral the least ones are the negatively charged substances with that note let's move into the next question as filtrate flows through pct concentration of all of the following decreases except as the fluid passes through the pct one substance concentration is going to increase here what is that any guess any idea yes you are answering correctly it is chloride why sir what is the concept listen very carefully guys in proximal tubule sodium around 70 percentage of sodium is reabsorbed here particularly in the first half of pct sodium is reabsorbed along with phosphate it is resorbed along with glucose it is resorbed along with amino acid because preferentially in the first half of pct sodium is not resorbed with chloride it is resorbed along with phosphate glucose and amino acid that means in the lumen chloride concentration will definitely increase because sodium and chloride are not resorbed sodium is resorbed with other substances so automatically in the later half of pct chloride concentration rises chloride will move from high concentration in lumen towards the low concentration inside cells substance moving from high concentration to low concentration what is this transport process sir yes diffusion in the second half of pct fluoride is resorbed by passive diffusion mechanisms very simple logic if you look into the entire length of pct it is the chloride concentration which keeps on increasing because sodium is preferentially resorbed with other substances and not chloride because chloride concentration is rising it is moving because of diffusion gradient chloride in the later half of pct definitely gets resorbed by passive diffusion mechanism simple all right guys now look at this question acid base nomogram diagram is given below 
changes in PCO2 are shown by curve lines. Areas marked with A and D indicate which of the following conditions. Look at this diagram. What do you think is A and D? A very important diagram, acid-base nomogram. Let me tell you the answer first. It is chronic respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis. How to find out, sir? Very simple. This diagram, before understanding this clearly, let me just put you a simple equation in front of you now. What is that equation, sir? pH equals 6.1 plus log base bicarbonate divided by 0.03 into PCO2. What is this equation? Tell me, guys, now. Tell me, tell me, tell me. This equation is our Henderson Hasselbalch equation, which has got three important parameters pH, yes, base, bicarbonate, and PCO2. The relationship between these three can be plotted with the help of a diagram. The name of the diagram is called Davenport diagram or the acid base nomogram. Davenport diagram. Are these three parameters shown? Yes, look carefully. Arterial pH is there. Bicarbonate is there. PCO2 levels are there. To approach this diagram, you need to first know about the normal values. Let me show you now. pH, the normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. PCO2 around 40 millimeters of mercury. And bicarbonate levels around 24 milli equivalents per liter. Now look very carefully. Six acid-base disorders can be found out with the help of this diagram. How many? Six. Let's approach them one by one. Metabolic acidosis. We all know acidosis means fall in pH. Metabolic acidosis is characterized by also fall in bicarbonate. With the help of arrow mark, let me show you the change. Fall in pH first. Yes, sir. Fall in bicarbonate. Yes, sir. Both these two point towards which box? Let us open that box now. Metabolic acidosis. First one. Let's move into metabolic alkalosis. Alkalosis is rise in pH. Alkali, bicarbonate. Alkalosis means rise in bicarbonate. Look carefully. Rise in pH, rise in bicarbonate. Both this point towards which box? Let's open that now. Metabolic alkalosis. Simple. Let's move into the next acute respiratory acidosis. Acidosis means fall in pH. Acid, acidosis, rise in PCO2. Look very carefully. First is fall in pH. Yes, sir. Rise in PCO2 more than 40 millimeters of mercury. Look very carefully. Rise in PCO2. Both these two point towards which box? And that box, let's open that acute respiratory acidosis. Here in this condition, there is no much of a compensation. Bicarbonate level tends to be normal or lightly elevated. There is no much compensation here. On the other hand, chronic respiratory acidosis, chronic C4C, there is a compensation. Kidney compensates here. Acidosis, fall in pH. Acidosis, rise in PCO2, compensation. To neutralize this acid, there is rise in bicarbonate. Let's look into the diagram. Fall in pH, rise in PCO2, rise in bicarbonate. Compensation. All these three point towards which box? Let's unlock that box now. Chronic respiratory acidosis. The next one. Acute respiratory alkalosis. Alkalosis, rise in pH. Look very carefully. It is alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis, which means fall in PCO2. Let's see now, rise in pH, yes sir, fall in PCO2. PCO2 is falling less than 40 millimeters of mercury. Both these two point towards which box? Let's unlock that acute respiratory alkalosis. Now we know chronic means compensation. Chronic respiratory alkalosis, it is alkalosis, rise in pH, fall in PCO2. But the compensation here, because it is alkali, alkalosis, there is fall in bicarbonate levels. Kidneys are excreting more bicarbonate here. Fall in bicarbonate. Let's look into the diagram. Rise in pH, fall in PCO2, fall in bicarbonate. All the three point towards which box? Let us open that box now. Chronic respiratory alkalosis. As I told you, with the help of Davenport diagram, 
six acid base disorders you can find out just pause this video revise this diagram again since it comes first there is definitely going to be a probability it will be repeated the one for diagram you need to remember the pH changes bicarbonate changes and PCO2 changes particularly for respiratory acidosis and alkalosis you need to remember the compensations acute stages and the chronic stages chronic is characterized by compensations six acid based disorders you can find out with the help of this diagram what is this diagram Davenport diagram let's move forward Reese ecker fluid practical physiology is used as a diluent for which of the following Reese ecker fluid is for platelet count for platelet counting we tend to use rbc pipette the answer is rbc pipette you need to remember the name of certain diluting fluids let me tell you the first one is something called as Haynes fluid any guess Haynes fluid where will we use any idea yes for RBC count so obviously RBC paper the second one Turk fluid T-U-R-K Turk fluid for WBC count WBC paper now the question Reese Ecker fluid for platelet count we usually use RBC paper for platelet count and final one Dunger's fluid in idea Dunger Dunger's fluid yes Dunger's fluid is for absolute eosinophil count eosinophil WBC we use WBC paper remember this names Reese-Eckers fluid is for platelet count we use RBC paper simple which of the following increases in COPD chronic obstructive pulmonary disease very simple any guess which of these volumes or capacities increase in COPD? Correct. The answers are FRC, functional residual capacity and total lung capacity. Even if you don't have much idea anything about this, you can clearly answer this question because the basic pathophysiology COPD is characterized by obstruction air trapping. Simple. Whenever there is air trapping, obviously which volume will increase residual volume will increase simple logic COPD air trapping residual volume will increase if you understand this let me show you certain capacities in lung which are four in number what are those capacities sir lung capacities inspiratory capacity FRC vital capacity total lung capacity look clearly in this formula where all residual volume is present let me put a circle mark residual volume is there in FRC residual volume is there in total lung capacity simple residual volume increases means FRC increases total lung capacity increases the hallmark for obstruction the hallmark for COPD is always decrease in FEV1 by FVC ratio fall in FEV1 by FVC ratio less than 70 percentage or 0.7 COPD fall in FEV1 by FVC ratio so obviously we see vital capacity vital capacity decreases FEV1 by FVC ratio decreases in COPD on the other hand residual volume increases because of that it is in the formula of FRC functional respiratory capacity total lung capacity both will increase in COPD simple logic simple next question deficiency of which clotting factor will not affect clotting in vivo deficiency of which clotting factor will not affect clotting in vivo any guess yes the answer is factor 12 first tell me what is the name of this factor 12 Nadia factor 12 what is this factor 12 also called as Hageman factor, yes. It is a component of intrinsic pathway or extrinsic pathway. Yes, it's a component of intrinsic pathway. This factor 12 deficiency, exact lines look very careful. Individuals with factor 12 deficiency do not experience excessive bleeding even after major surgical procedures or trauma. Factor 12, very important. Look very carefully. This factor 12 deficiency will not affect clotting in vivo because other clotting factors can compensate for this loss that's simple other clotting other clotting factors can compensate for the deficiency of factor 12.
the answer is factor 12 here let's move to the next question which type of amino acids are present in the transmembranous part of membrane receptor cell membrane transmembrane region which amino acids any guess yes it is hydrophobic what is the concept here sir let me make it totally simple for you guys look into the diagram first a cell membrane is shown a cell membrane particularly have how many layers single layer two layer or tri layer the answer is it is a bilayer cell membrane yes sir this is a cell membrane outside the cell membrane there is water what is this fluid outside the cell membrane extracellular fluid true inside the cell membrane there is water what is this water intracellular fluid true very simple water water loving is hydrophilic on the other hand transmembrane region where is this transmembrane region sir away from water in between these two membranes this transmembrane region is always hydrophobic it is for this reason transmembrane part is away from water it is hydrophobic look very carefully a particular protein is shown here a transmembrane protein familiarly called as integral membrane proteins we know this particularly in the transmembrane region it is having certain amino acids let me circle them obviously this amino acid should be hydrophobic transmembrane is hydrophobic simple next physiology and biochemistry one more structure is also shown here having head and a tail in pink color head and a tail in pink color what are they yes phospholipids this phospholipid head it is towards water hydrophilic this phospholipid tail is away from water hydrophobic transmembrane region will have tails of phospholipids which are hydrophobic and certain amino acids which are hydrophobic transmembrane is hydrophobic very simple logic that's all next question least frequency of basal electrical rhythm is seen in gi physiology any guess basic or basal electrical rhythm what is this first what generates this basic electrical rhythm what are those pacemakers all are familiar questions any guess let's have a discussion the answer is stomach simple what is this basal or basic electrical rhythm sir it is a form of restless membrane potential oscillating fluctuating simple the oscillating membrane potential in the range of minus 60 to minus 40 millivolt in GI smooth muscle is called the basic electrical rhythm what actually generates this the pacemaker cells which are our causal cells responsible for this basal electrical rhythm in GI tract segments a very important table where it is highest this fluctuation is highest in duodenum 12 per minute other areas very simple the least one is always c cup 2 per minute if c cup is not there the next best answer is stomach we are clearly saying it is 4 per minute maximum in duodenum the oscillations are 12 per minute the least is in c cup 2 per minute the next least is in stomach that is 4 per minute the answer for the question is stomach 4 oscillations per minute that's all Calculate respiratory quotient in a patient with a 50 kg body weight, CO2 exhaled 200 ml per minute and O2 consumed 250 ml per minute. Calculation based MCQ, respiratory quotient, any guess, any idea? What is the formula? Physiology and biochemistry, simple. The answer is 0.8. Discussion, what is this sir? Respiratory quotient is also called by one other familiar name. What is that? Respiratory quotient is also called as respiratory exchange ratio what is the formula simple because of metabolism of any nutrient for that matter oxygen is consumed carbon dioxide is produced because of metabolism oxygen is cons consumed carbon dioxide is produced very simple the formula is rate of carbon dioxide output by rate of oxygen uptake in numerator carbon dioxide in denominator oxygen so what is given the values here 200 by 250 that is 0.8 if you take a diet that is ex 
exclusively only carbohydrates. What is the respiratory exchange ratio, sir? 1. If you take a diet that is exclusively fats or lipids, it is 0.7. But what is the reality, sir? We are taking a mixed diet having carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, everything. In a typical mixed diet, the respiratory quotient is 0.8. For carbohydrate rich meal, 1. For fats, 0.7. For mixed diet, it is 0.8. What is the formula? It is the rate of C carbon dioxide output by rate of oxygen uptake. How much of CO2 is produced for the oxygen consumed? That's all. In the diagram, a simple muscle twitch with a time trace below is recorded in a frog gastrocnemius muscle. Calculate the minimum tetanizing frequency of this muscle. Time tracer is done with the 100 hertz tuning fork. Again, a familiar repeat from the AIMS exam asked previously. First thing to remember, the time tracing each small curves here corresponds to 10 milliseconds. In this typical simple muscle twitch, how to calculate contraction period, sir? From the point of start of this curve till the peak point of this curve, that is between points B and C, is our contraction period. After this contraction period is our relaxation period. For this calculation, we need to calculate the contraction period, which is between B to C. How much is the time frame here? How many small curves are here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Each corresponds to 10 milliseconds. So, 6 corresponds to 60 milliseconds contraction period. If you know the contraction period, what is the formula for tetanizing frequency? Sir, I told you before. What is the formula for tetanizing frequency? It is the inverse of contraction period. 1 by contraction period. So, 1 by 60. That comes around 17 per second. Simple logic. If you stimulate this gastrocnemius muscle per second, 17 stimulation, there is a smooth, sustained state of contraction. There will not be any relaxation in between. In the simple muscle twitch, we are saying a relaxation. But in tetany, it's a sustained state of contraction. For that, the frequency needed is 17 per second in this gastrocnemius muscle. There will not be any relaxation, a sustained state of tetany contraction. The formula for tetanizing frequency is 1 by contraction period. All these are very important questions, particularly asked in this INICAT. Now we have a very important discussion for the two. From this explanations, you can expect lots of further MCQs in upcoming exams. Now, the answer for the question is C, 17 per second. Look into this important video, guys. I have something to show you here. Our very well-known Usain Bolt. In one race, many of you have not watched this video. Now watch this. What happened? He stumbled. He is way behind. And finally, what is the end result? He won. What I told you, exactly at the start of the race, he fumbled. In such a high profile race, having world class athletes running side by you, a small stumble, you know where it will be. But what happened to Usain Bolt? Stumbles are always the stepping stones to success. Even though he stumbled, the only thing he did is he believed in himself. Always believe in yourself. There may be lot of stumbles in our lives. Take them as stepping stones. If you believe in yourself, you can achieve anything. This is about Usain Bolt. Even though he stumbles, he believed in himself. He won't finally. Next important one. Look at this man. Oh my goodness. Who is he? Justin Gatlin. At the age of 36 years, he was a chronic underdog. Always loses to Usain Bolt. But he never gave up. He never lost his hope. 
remember persistence perseverance determination can take you anywhere he won the race against Usain Bolt at the age of 36 years it's just a number age is just a number persist please never give up please don't lose hope anything in this world is conquerable nothing is difficult anything in this world is conquerable even at the age of 36 years persistence and determination and never give up attitude made him to win that race just in him i like him very much with that important note now look very carefully guys definitely lot of students ask me whatever i learn i tend to forget sir i cannot remember anything at all sir from my side a very simple tip for you anybody can do this what is the small technique sir imagination technique what is this imagination technique you read anything for that matter for example you are reading about copd simple you read the material we all read the material after reading what all we tend to commonly do again we look into that book and revise for some time but what is this imagination technique you close your books Close your eyes. When you read medicine, you yourself imagine as a physician. Just to close your eyes, think a patient is coming to you. Whatever clinical features you learn in your notes, just imagine the patient is speaking to you. Just speak it out inside your brain. The patient is telling you those symptoms. You are listening to those symptoms. Now, as a physician, imagine what clinical diagnosis you will come in for that what are all the investigations you will add up just tell to yourself imagine 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 we all know imagination anticipation just imagining doing exercise if you just imagine i am going to do exercise our body will rise your heart rate your body will rise your respiratory rate it will prepare you to the situation Imagination is very powerful. Just to simply imagining you are going to do exercise. You are not doing. Just imagine you are going to do exercise. Your body will prepare you. Your body is very efficient. Just use it properly. It will rise heart rate for you. It will rise respiratory for you. It will make you ready. Imagine yourself as a physician. When you read pathology, histopathological findings, close your eyes. Just imagine you sitting under a microscope, looking into the microscope now. What are all the clinical findings you or the histopathological features you read before? Just to see it. Just tell to yourself, I am seeing this finding. Yes, I am seeing this finding. Yes, I am seeing this finding. Now, the, the, the diagnosis is this. Now, close your eyes. Imagine. Talk to yourself. You become a physician. You become a surgeon. You become a pathologist. You become an orthopedician. To treat a fracture, what will you do? You become a surgeon, what are all the procedures you do? What are all the important incisions you put? You become that. You take the role of a surgeon and just talk to yourself. It will definitely get imprinted in your brain. It is what I usually follow. Imagination technique will be very powerful. Just to try this. And we all know the upcoming exams definitely it is going to be a very 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 integrated paper clinical scenarios lot of clinical scenarios is going to come it is like you are going to sit in an opd you are going to see lot of patients the examiner will ask you what is the best investigation what is the next best thing to do what is the diagnosis what is the treatment what side effects you expect for this drug that's all Big scenario questions. Integrated learning is very important. Please try to integrate and learn. Respiratory medicine include respiratory anatomy, respiratory physiology, respiratory pathology, respiratory medicine, pulmonology. Just integrate and learn. That will make you to retain the information for a longer period. Definitely the future exams are going to be clinical scenario based with a lot of integrated pattern MCQs. The questions are going to be very, very lengthy. Definitely the questions are going to be very, very lengthy. That means you need to have a proper time management. Time management, guys.
what to do sir for this time management please make a note write lot of grant test they are the practice test for you please write grant test any source for that matter having this clinical integration scenario type questions just do lots of practice test minimum do two grant test in a week and read explanation thoroughly grant test is or the most important one that help you for proper time management very important what i'm trying to tell you here going by the current situation definitely we can expect safely our neat pg to happen around the month of april most probably in the month of april we have sufficient time let me tell you who have not preferable who have not started still even you can start now this month itself is sufficient if you work properly to definitely get a rank so there is sufficient time here now use it wisely which step have you reached today there are lot of steps here i won't do it i can't do it how do i do it but i want all of you guys to write in the comment section for me i will do it sir this is the step i want from whatever step you are in just write in the comment section yes sir i will do it once you achieve your dreams once you pursue your passion come back again to this video write below yes sir i did it now write i will do it once you get your dream pages it come below and write yes sir i did it i will see that and i'll be very happy to see that my sincere prayers are always there for you guys to get your dream pg seat pursue your passion guys very important enjoy life go behind your dreams pursue your passion thank you so much bye bye